Thank you very much. Actually, today I'm going to talk about the Right Livelihood Awards. There are many people on this planet who do good things and nice things, but they're not challenging the rules and not changing the rules of the game. On the other hand, there are a lot of people who have exact ideas how we can change the rules, how we can solve the problems around um, human rights, around education, around um, environment, but in practicality, they don't achieve anything. Those people who combine those rare capabilities of achieving something, but also challenging the rules and, and changing the rules of the game, they are candidates for the Right Livelihood Awards every year. Um, and the Right Livelihood Award has been dubbed by the press as the alternative Nobel Prize. And I was not sure when I got Julian's email uh, or invitation to talk today, I was not aware that you would be here. I think it's a wonderful, it's a wonderful combination uh, to see different facets of, of what the people are doing. Let me quickly introduce to you um, this year's laureates, and then I tell you a little bit more about the price, the function, and give you some, I think, very fundamental examples of how individuals and their work can actually change the world. Here we have this year's um, laureates. We have on the upper left-hand corner, Hayrettin Karacha from Turkey, a 90-year-old uh, successful businessman who is called the grandfather of the environmental movement in Turkey. Um, his organization, Tima, with more than three million uh, volunteers, is the largest environmental uh, organization in Turkey. And he started to fight um, soil erosion and started to build uh, natural habitats almost 50 years ago. So th this award also goes to some sustainable endeavors, let's put it that way. Um, then we have Sima Simar. Some of you might be familiar with her from Afghanistan, a medical doctor who built under the Taliban regime um, uh, schools for girls, the only way to get education for girls, on a tremendous personal threat and making sure that women and girls have access to medical care. She's still under threat. Um, she has been also on the list, I think, a couple of times for the Peace Nobel Prize. Uh, we'll have her in uh, Stockholm this, um, this year. Jean Sharp, um, we said, well, somehow it's a pretty old portfolio this year, but for a good reason. Jean Sharp is a scholar from um, Massachusetts, and he introduced the topic of nonviolence into academic research. Um, when he was doing his PhD thesis in the, in the 60s, he said that there has been so much research on how to wage a war successfully. Um, there's something about peace studies, but nobody has ever really done research in what makes nonviolence work and how can it be powerful. And he analyzed what Gandhi did. Um, he analyzed other examples, the resistance of the Norwegians against the German occupation during the Second World War. And what he was able to do, he translated his research into very, very practical recommendations. He was invited to speak in Burma in the 80s, and he said, okay, I condensed that into, by now, 110 rules how to topple a dictatorship. And this guy's works have been read by many, many activists in the Arab Spring. The works have been read on Tahrir Square. They're all, I mean, he all distributes that in like 80 languages for free. Um, somebody who now sees at the age of 86 really what ideas and what effective nonviolence can actually accomplish. Then we have the compa campaign against arms trade, a small NGO from uh, the UK. They do a wonderful thing. They create transparency into the arms trade in terms of what you need in statistics. Do you want to know where the weapons go? Do you want to know um, where actually where taxpayers' money is being used for that? I always thought that the arms uh, industry is a pretty profitable industry, but interestingly enough, there are high, high amounts of uh, taxpayers' money going into subsidies. So they make that transparent, uh, transparent uh, pretty uh, intelligent campaigns. Why do we do this? We give this award to honor outstanding visions and work for the practical problems of this planet and in its inhabitants. What the prize does, here you see that's a typical scene, the prize is awarded every year in the, uh, in the Swedish parliament. You see the founder, Jakob von Uxkel, up there with two laureates. It recognizes what people have been doing. It awards them for, the, for what they have been doing. It, it creates awareness about the problems, about, um, about the issues they're tackling, and it gives protection. 
In other words, for our laureates, the prize is not very highly donated. We're not, unfortunately, the founder, he did not invent, no, uh, he did not invent um, uh, dynamite. I mean, he sold off um, a stamp collection, a, a precious stamp collection to start, um, uh, to start this prize. Um, so the, the, the monetary award is not the, the, biggest, um, the biggest focus. What it does, it opens access to more resources for our laureates. That, that certainly works. Uh, Monika Hauser, the um, founder of Medica Mondial here in Germany, she said that donations basically tripled after she, she got the award. What it does, it, it opens doors. It opens doors for people who have been harassed, who have been threatened in their work. Suddenly there are in their respective countries, they are known and they are protected, they are untouchable. I mean, we have, um, we have uh, statements from laureates who said after their return from the ceremony, who had been harassed uh, uh, seriously, had been in prison, whatever, uh, where the official, uh, official said, now you are untouchable. A very, 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 very important uh, factor of uh, the award. And I'm going to give you some examples that that protection is needed, needed, and further needed. Actually. Karaca, the Turkish guy, 90 years old, he's currently in court in Turkey. It's not even clear that he can make it to the award ceremony. Why they have been protesting illegal land grabs in Turkey, and uh, they put a 90-year-old guy into court, charging him with Landfriedensburg, whatever that is in English. Um, I would like you to meet um, a couple of those laureates. Vangari Matai from Kenya, a trained biologist, started very early on to replant trees. She said, you know, if we save other species, take care of species, um, they will take care of us and save us. So she started to recognize the bad effects, the side effects of deforestation and started um, nurseries, uh, um, tree nurseries, and actually made the profession of somebody who's planting tree a respectable and profitable um, model for, for families and villages. She started the so-called green, uh, green Belt Movement. I don't know whether any one of you has heard about that. It started out in Kenya. Um, during her lifetime, 20 million trees have been planted in several African countries, but the Green Belt Movement also extends now to, um, to um, Asia. Uh, and basically, the idea is to have a green belt around the globe. Um, there is the Next Billion Tree Project, so it's a scalable thing. We look for things or models and solutions which are scalable. Um, she, was, she was really harassed under the Arab Moy regime when she started that and when she started to uh, criticize um, the, the unsustainable usage of land. Um, she got the alternative Nobel Prize in 1984 and 20 years later she was awarded with the Peace Nobel Prize. She passed away last year, um, as some of you might have followed, but we're quite proud that we have some laureates, three altogether, who were awarded a Peace Nobel Prize later on. So in terms of like a scouting system, do, do, we see, do we see new leaders, new ideas? Um, I think we, uh, uh, we have some good choices there. On the right hand side, you see Jacqueline Modena. Jacqueline Modena is a human rights lawyer in Chad. I've just returned from a second visit to, to, to Chad. I researched, uh, researched her last year in Chad and I said I never want to go back to that place. But then uh, things were heating up because um, what she is doing, she represents the victims of the Abre regime. Um, Isen Abre, the former president of Chad, is also called the African Pinochet, and that certainly is no, uh, no flattering name. Um, 150 people have been uh, tortured, have been um, in prison um, under uh, his regime, and more than 50,000 people have been killed. Um, Abre took the, the money of the government and fled to Senegal and established himself a very comfortable life there. Uh, just three months ago, the uh, International uh, Court of Justice, not the criminal, but the Court of Justice in The Hague, has decided that he has to be put on trial in Senegal. Um, otherwise, Belgium, which has a law that anybody who has committed tor torture anywhere in the world can be tried in Belgium, otherwise he has to be extradited to Belgium. So things are heating up because trying an old dictator. Um, the victims are still alive. Um, creates a lot of unsettlement in the current government. Uh, the current government in Chad, the, the current president used to be the Secretary of the Interior under the, um, 
under the dictatorship and many key personnel in the police and the army and the administration are still in place. Um, we went there with a couple of other laureates on an official mission um, to basically, well, to, to hand over the prize again, to make it also public and chart that we awarded uh, Jacqueline uh, Modena for her work to put him to court. I mean, it's, I mean, she had to get lawyer's licenses in the, in the relevant states. Um, and in Senegal, uh, she is representing 350 of the victims. Um, and she has fought all of this through together with people or lawyers from Human Rights Watch. Um, and she needs, she needs protection at that time. And so we had a couple of meetings with the official, with ambassadors, with the Chadian human rights minister who explained to us that as soon as people knew the laws, um, violations would automatically end. And no, the Chadian government doesn't have any responsibility to compensate the victims or to deal with that. They would have their private trial in Senegal and it's up to Senegal what's happening with them. So very different understandings of, uh, of um, yeah, human rights and, and impunity, how to deal with impunity. So that's Jacqueline. Let's keep our fingers crossed that actually Senegal will start the, um, the court trial this December. This is Martin Almada from Paraguay. Um, Martin is an educator and was in prison and tortured for over five years under the Stroessner regime, uh, one of the, um, or the, the, the dictator in the time when most uh, South American countries had dictatorships. Um, after Martin was released, um, his wife was missing. He didn't know what happened to her. He went into exile and started to work uh, in Argentina um, to make sure that the people responsible, the perpetrators, could go to court um, and can be tried. Um, he, he also, you see him here in the uh, Palacio de Justicia in Asuncion. Um, he wanted to find the files because even after Stresner had resigned, they said, no, he was not in prison, that's not true. That was, you know, there was no proof of what had happened and he discovered the archives of the secret police and actually not just of the Paraguayan secret police, but the, if, if you guys know the uh, Operation Condor, the secret police of the Latin American countries work together on, uh, on keep, keeping up the suppression. So he found the archive, this is actually him with his own detention card and until that time, they always had said, no, it's not true, he's just telling stories. He was never in a camp and has never been tortured, but he found his file, and he also found out that, that his wife was killed um, in, in prison. Uh, Martin Almada is incredible. He's 78 years old. He went with us to Chad. He's working on getting international observers to the court, uh, to the trial in Senegal. Um, he's bringing in the judge who tried Pinochet as an observer. So in terms of making sure that Perpetrators are not safe wherever, wherever they are, and to fight impunity. He's an incredible, um, he's an incredible person, really, really making a difference. Um, he has established a museum, um, basically to, to, to document all of those, those crimes, and he has established a network of museums. And we're going to see an addition, hopefully in Chad, with another museum uh, remembering what happens if you have a dictatorship and violation of human rights. Okay, um, I skip Monika Hauser, those in Germany uh, know her quite well. René Ngongo, who recognized that the tropical rainforests of um, the Democratic Republic of, of Congo are second to, to those of the Amazonas as a lung of the planet, um, is an environmentalist, and he's working, he's developing alternative models to prote uh, protect the rainforest. People usually cut down, uh, there are two things, people use the wood for firewood, and you have illegal logging. So he's fighting on both. And he has developed methods where people can actually do agriculture in the rainforest without cutting down the trees. He's developing models for that. He's also developing models for how do you go through a forest and get uh, uh, cooking wood or firewood without cutting the trees just by using old dead branches. Um, and he's bringing alternatives. He knows that people have to eat and people need light. Um, so he's working on affordable solar energy uh, in the communities in Congo. Now, this guy has been severely harassed. When, his, um, um, when he was awarded with a prize in the, um, in the Swedish government, I, you were there, right, in the Swedish parliament, I thought, wow, he must have a lot of friends. There was like a, a large delegation. I thought, well, every laureate can bring, what, 30, 40 people all dressed up in traditional costumes. 
No, it turned out this was the whole staff of the Congolese embassy in Stockholm. And the papers in, in Congo titled Our First Nobel. They didn't care whether it was a right livelihood award or whatever. <laughs> now this guy is known. He has meetings with the president, with the um, secretary of agriculture, and they really have made progress on the illegal logging uh, topic. A single guy who started out with then saying we have to change this. How do we find the laureates? Everybody on this planet can nominate anybody. That's very interesting. You also get some very interesting nominations on people who can heal millions through the internet, but you know, there's some quality <laughs> insurance to make sure that we don't spend too much time on that. Um, everybody can nominate anybody, and we go out there. We go in the field and really take a look at where are they working, how are they working. We talk to, well, it's like a due diligence. I mean, you mentioned I've been in classic consulting. It's a due diligence. You go out there, you talk with the competitors, you talk with the people they cooperate with. You want to get an understanding. Is that serious? Is that sustainable? Is that scalable, what they're doing? And I mean, I've, I've seen quite a bit of the world when I was a consultant, but going to Eastern Congo and Chad was certainly not on the itinerary uh, with BCG. What changes for them? They all become members of the Right Livelihood College. They support each other. The, networks have, uh, the, the, the laureates have a very close network. They do things like solidarity visits. They, they uh, sign appeals together. It's a very, very close network. And what they do is they translate solutions. So Rene Ngongo from Congo is working with Gramin Shakti in Bangladesh to work on the affordable solar energy. Um, the campus, the Right Livelihood College, has campuses all around the world. Make it very quick. Why do we want you to know about that? Again, you can nominate somebody. But if you want to see inspiring examples, the solutions are already there. I think this is a source to go to. And where the sources are, it's all on the web, um, including more portraits of the laureates and um, including more information on the foundation. Thank you very much. Yeah.